Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Helen DeGuri Simpson, The Right. Save for the sighing of the trees, it was a silent little wood. No birds nested there. The thumping of the rabbits could not have made itself heard on the moss, which was spread underfoot like a soft couch for lovers. No stream ran by it. It rose from the valley, a thin shaft of darker green against the slope of the grass, and spread out at last to compass the top of the round hill. The shape and secret look of it had not changed since Roman days, such as must have stifled all smaller growths, all flowers with shadow. Yet flowers grew there. They were curious flowers, spotted with purple and green, fleshy, and they seemed to creep upon the ground, giving forth a warm and sleepy smell. They were not like the honest flowers the hedgerows that clung close to the earth, or sent a spire of blossom towering into the air. They grew low, obscenely shaped, and when they were plucked, wilted at once and turned brown before they died. The villagers would never touch them, for they hated the wood and all the things that grew there. Parvis Holt, they called it, and there was a saying, Black as Parvis at noonday. Certainly it was always very dark there, and not cool. On this spring day, impregnated with the warmth of the later year, Len was drawn to it. She had gone out of the house in a sullen temper, leaving her work, angry at being obliged to choose, and at having that choice forced upon her always by her mother's hints and insistent comparisons. Since her mother was so willing to have her gone, let her see what it's like, Len thought, when I'm married and there's no one to help. So she walked out into the street as though she were going for water, but there was no bucket in her hand, and she went on past the pump, the shop, and along the road that skirted the hill on whose farther side Parvis Holt lay. There was no plan in her mind, but rather a blank fury which would permit no thought. The morning was far advanced. Already it was almost twelve, and as she walked, hatless, the high sun struck down upon the crown of her head like a powerful hand. It forced itself upon her consciousness. Through her anger she became aware of it, unwillingly, but it suited her fierce mood and she walked defiantly on. The dust clouded about her feet as she trudged. The air was busy with insects. Unheeding, a bee droned past her. She longed for a stick with which to cut down the drowsy, nodding heads of the flowers by the way. Her hands grew red and heavy, swinging by her side. The road was pitiless, and she knew it ran bare along the hill for nearly two miles before it came to shelter. But she was obstinate. She thought, I don't care if I drop. Serve her right if they were to come out here and find me lying dead. She was not afraid of death, which had its picturesque aspects, but this penetrating awful discomfort was unbearable. For a while, she soothed herself and employed her thoughts by imagining how she would look lying pale on the roadside to be discovered by a horseman riding past. He would dismount and kneel beside her. He would take her hand or lift her up with an arm about his shoulders, but she would be silent, with closed eyes, and he would know that she had died because nobody cared. Her eyes were blurred with the pathos of this scene, before an unsuspected stone striking her toe revealed to her the world of facts again, and the facts were that she would not be pale but red if she died of the sun, that there were no horsemen now, and that her whole quarrel with life was being wanted too much. The sun was malignant. It held her neck and shoulders in a strong grip, from which she could not escape, though she writhed the muscles and put a hand to the back of her neck. The dust, swirling higher as her feet moved more listlessly, had a sharp and acrid smell. She hated it, and trod heavily, as though by doing so she could prevent it from rising to vex her nostrils. The insects became more persistent, more infuriating. A cohort of flies wheeled and circled about her head, brushing her skin, settling upon her hair, and she was defenseless. Every moment her resentment changed its quality. It ceased to be dull in general, and became actively directed against the causes of her present discomfort, the sun, the dust, and the flies. She even thought longingly of the house she had left an hour ago, and the cool front room that faced away from the sun. She turned the corner of the hill, and lifted her eyes to find the dark trees of Parvis before her. As a rule, Len, like the other villagers, feared Parvis, and would not set foot within its shadowed and dangerous borders. Now it seemed to welcome and invite her. The motionless trees would make a constant shade where she might soon forget the white furnace of the road. She halted, wondering. Then the sun smote her on the cheek she had turned to it, and with a hand lifted against the treacherous branches, she broke through the hedge and into the mystery of the wood. There was no path, 
but looking about, she discovered a way between the trees where the growth was less dense, and followed it, stepping high over the bracken and the unnamed flowers. Even in this relief of coolness, she was afraid to tread those hateful things underfoot. She went forward and upward, seeking a clear space where she might lie and perhaps sleep. The trees closed in behind her, a silent regiment. She went forward still, putting aside the branches whose thorns held her, towards a point where it seemed that the trees grew more sparsely at the top of the hill. Her hands and forehead were sweating. The climb had been a steep one. She paused and took the pins from her loosened hair, meaning to coil it afresh, but it clung about her hot hands and would not be settled comfortably. She let it lie upon her shoulders, the roots darkened with sweat, the ends gleaming gold, even here where there was no sun, and breathing deeply, went on. The trees began to shoulder each other less closely. The undergrowth, with its speckled, creeping flowers, ceased altogether, and she trod now upon moss in which her footsteps were lost, springy to the tread. Panting, she stopped at last, and with a quick animal movement lay down, her body supported by the forked roots of a tree, feet pressed up against a rounded stone which stuck up out of the moss smooth and gray. On the side turned away from her were little marks and slashes, as though it had once been carved at some semblance of life. Now that the more immediate annoyance of the heat had ceased, her mind returned again to its problem. She considered it without passion, lazily, as though it were a matter with which she need not concern herself. But for all that, it was urgent enough. Her mother had said that very morning that Arthur would not wait forever. There were lots of girls after him, with his medals and his farm, and both parents dead. If only her mother could have let her alone, she would have given him her answer long ago but she did not care to seem as though she had no mind of her own. She knew it was a good thing for her, without all this telling. But there was Steve. She wanted Steve badly. She admitted it. The very thought of him tempted her. He was strong and fair. The sort of man she liked. The sort of man a girl would be proud of for a husband. He was only a laborer, and he lived with his mother in a dirty cottage by the river, from which they were sometimes flooded out in winter. There was no furniture there like Arthur had in his house. There would only be an old iron bed with a thin lumpy mattress, and the old woman groaning and tossing in her sleep so that you could hear her in the next room. And she was pious, always God this and God that, not like Steve. He was a real man, strong. He didn't go whining, pretending to be grateful and all the time afraid of hell. He wasn't afraid of anything or anybody. But Arthur had the money. There was the problem nakedly set out. Arthur had the money, and Steve had something, not looks exactly, but something she wanted. Well, there it was. She couldn't have both. Len's resentment began once more to gather. She was angry with a world where such alternatives must be faced. The thought of her mother's triumphant eyes if she took Arthur was odious to her. But the thought of the solid, shining furniture going to another was odious, too. She kicked the bedded stone and shifted uneasily, rubbing her shoulders against the rough bark of the tree. The current of her thought changed as the movement recalled her surroundings. What would they all think if they knew she had been alone in Parvis, walked right up into it? Why did they make such a song about Parvis? It felt all right, though the flowers were funny. People used to say they died as soon as they were picked. She wondered, idly at first, but later was stirred by curiosity to rise and go through the trees a little way to where a cluster of pale leaves grew, with grayish petals showing above them. They felt warm to her hands, like flesh, and the stems did not snap but yielded softly in a sickening way. She gathered a handful, however, with some of the leaves, and going back to the tree by the stone, lay down again with the flowers in her lap. They were not shaped much like flowers, she thought, more like animals, and there were ugly purple spots on the gray surface. She began to twist them together, the long, soft stalks and the pale leaves, into a round shape like a crown. They hadn't begun to die yet. Perhaps it was all a lot of lies. The wood was all right. It hadn't done anything to her. She thought again of Steve. But what was the use? He must get some other girl. If he worked all his life, he could never be as rich as Arthur. Money was the only thing that mattered in the long run. Other things, perhaps, for a time. But they didn't last. Youth went so soon. And soon... When a man had got what he wanted, he didn't care. Oh, God. But what was the use of that? God was forever talking of houses, the beauty of his houses, his many mansions. God would be on Arthur's side. 
If there could be a god of gardens and woods, it might be worthwhile to pray, here in this chapel of trees whose branches gathered to the vault above her, nobly ordered as though they sprang, not from the mutable flesh of growing things, but from the obedient stone. Such a god would listen and be kind. She looked down at the circle of flowers, and it seemed in the green twilight that already the edges showed a brownish tinge, but they stood firmly, and the leaves had not yet begun to droop, those strange leaves that felt warm as her fingers closed upon them. The moss, too, was warm. In the dim loneliness of the wood, she would have liked to feel that softness against her bare skin. She could lie there with her hair about her shoulders all afternoon until the heat was gone, unseen, unknown. In this light her body would look green, like a dead thing. For an instant the thought startled her, but she stretched upwards with her arms into the shadowed air and felt life pulse in the fingers and was reassured. It would take a lot to put out that life, running so strongly. But what was the use of it? She knew how she wanted to give herself, but her heart rebelled at the thought of the one-sided bargain. It would be fine to flare up like a great flame, but in a while that would be done with, and he might change or be false, and the power, the great force of her body, be withered away. Youth gone, love gone, so soon and for so little. The flowers were dying. They seemed to droop and fail like animals, and the petals were discolored with a darkening stain that spread as she watched, like blood. With a sudden spurt of impulse, unaccountable, she threw them from her, and the crown fell upon the stone and hung there. She laughed aloud, defiantly. Let the old face have them, the ugly things, dead already. The words beat their way into her mind. That was what she would be if she married Arthur, dead, and buried in a bed with a man beside her, who didn't even know that she was not alive any more. She would go walking about and talking, but something would be dead. It wasn't right. It was against something. Life ought to come first. But with Steve, would that be life any more than the other? Ah, yes, even there in that dirty house, in poverty, even though it didn't last, it would be life. There would be something to show for the years, not happiness, but a longing satisfied, a purpose fulfilled. Life ran deep. Its meaning and end were dark as this wood, dark as Parvis at noon. A sudden horror came upon her, a dreadful fear of the darkness that could so reveal hidden things. She scrambled to her feet and stood, holding her fear in check, madly seeking with her eyes the way she had come. She found a broken branch in another, and followed slowly down the almost invisible track of her own passage. Slowly, her heart stifled with terror. Not daring to run, lest she should lose her reason, and be caught forever by the menacing trees, the vile flowers. Slowly, stepping high as though in some solitary measure, she made her way down the hill, and her staring, shifting eyes found at last the glow of warm light from the road. Now it was almost evening, and the leaves began to waver in a faint breeze. They whispered, and once there was a sound almost of laughter. The crown of flowers that had fallen upon the stone hung there still, and sent out upon the air that warm and sleepy odor as of beasts lying close. But the flowers were not dead. They hung there, living, and they were still alive when a great wind came up from the south two days later and scattered them. The End